Good morning, folks. It's good to have you in our morning service here at Trinity Baptist Church. We are going to be in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 5. Um, I take complete responsibility for last week's sermon and the lack of recording. I did not record the service last week. I forgot. So uh, I remembered about halfway into the sermon. I remembered, but it was too late to start. So today we are going to do a very quick review because we need to. And in order to do that, the preacher who forgot to start this as well needs to do that. Our other preachers are more organized than this one. But uh, some days I can get it pretty good and other days I can't. Just a moment. Now, I'm not going to start that yet because I'm only going to show you one slide, which is where we pick up today. Uh, but we're going to review very quickly. We're going to go back. We're going to read chapter 5. It's a short chapter. I think it's only 14 verses. So we're going to read chapter 5, and we're going to just skim through and hit the most important points as we uh, go through that chapter. Chapter 5, verse 1, we have the words that say, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, and because no man was found worthy, No man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, remember there are 24 elders around the throne representing the New Testament church age people. Christians from the time of Jesus and the apostles until the tribulation period. The rapture is when that ends. So this over 2,000 years now, or about 2,000 years, the, all of the Christians, the true born-again believers from that time period are represented by those 24 elders, they're called. And one of the elders, verse 5, saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Verse 6, And I beheld, that means I, he looked and he saw, I beheld. And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Now he called it, in verse 5, he called it a lion. But here he says he looked and he saw a lamb. The, uh, in the midst of the throne and four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth verse 7 and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne and when he had taken the book the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Now, can I just make a comment here so we won't have to go back and do it later? When you see this transfer of authority from God the Father to God the Son, God the Father is the one who is on the throne. God the Son is represented by the Lamb, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. That's Jesus, God the Son. And we see a transfer of authority and power from God the Father to God the Son when the Son takes 
the book, the scroll, from the hand of the Father. When he takes that scroll from him, there's a transfer of authority, transfer of power given to the Son to be the judge. What, let me ask you something. When there is a transfer of power in government, in a monarchy, anytime, or uh, there's always a ceremony that happens, and there's always celebration and, and uh, an eruption of, of uh, some kind of music and some kind of a cheering and, and uh, excitement. When there's a, a new president in the United States, a, a new president is inducted into office. At that moment, you'll hear cheering and clapping and there's a lot of excitement, right? In heaven, when the transfer of power, transfer of authority, I should say, comes from the Father to the Son to administer this judgment upon the rebellion of mankind in the world called seven years of tribulation. When that begins here, that's what this book is. This scroll is a scroll of judgment. All right? And those seven seals that are sealing that scroll, each one of those represents a different judgment. And most of them represent multiple judgments inside them. But here, the one, the only one who has the authority to open them and administer this judgment is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, Messiah, God, the Son. Okay? And at the moment that that transfer happens, this is what happened. Verse uh, 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Verse 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and twenty-four, el four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by, the, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and I heard notice he says I beheld that means he looked and he saw again verse 11 and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts those are angelic beings and the elders the 24 elders who represent all Christians and the number of them the number of the angels was and listen carefully 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands now I've heard preachers and Bible commentators say, well, that if you calculate that, you know, there's a certain number. I believe it represents something else. I believe it very clearly represents an innumerable amount, uh, a number that can't be calculated. He said 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You usually say that when you're expressing that there was just a vast number that nobody really knows how many there are. Now, God knows, of course. It doesn't really matter if it was an exact number that you could calculate, all right, with this, with this uh, expression of numbers, or if it just means there's just so many that nobody knows how many there are. It doesn't matter on our part. God knows, and that's all that matters to us, okay? But there was a vast number of angels. So what were they doing? Um, let's see, I lost my place. Heard the voice 10,000. Okay, verse 12. Verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 
We will explain that in just a few minutes, okay? Verse 13, and every creature that which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Can you get the scene in your mind? The strong angel has come forward and he made an announcement. And he said, Who is worthy to open the book? The scroll with the seven seals. God the Father is on the throne. He's holding the book in his right hand. And the angel makes the announcement. And the book is held forward. And heaven gets quiet. Silence. It's as if everybody's holding their breath. Waiting for somebody to step forward who is worthy to open the one who is worthy to pass this judgment on to this sinful, rebellious world. And suddenly, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, steps forward. And the moment he reaches forward to take that scroll from the Father's hand, an eruption of praise and glory to God bursts forth. Listen, the Bible says it, it was loud. The Bible uses the word, it was loud, loud. Now listen, I've got a big mouth, all right? And you know I can be loud. A, God made me that way, and it's okay with me. But we'll need those new glorified bodies that we're going to live in in heaven. We're going to need those bodies in heaven to be able to hear and, and not be just knocked backwards by that the, the volume of, of a vast number of angels and everybody else praising God, especially the Lamb when he comes forward to take that scroll. An eruption breaks forth of praise that will be loud. <laughs> it will be loud. And the singing, the song that will be sung by the 24 elders, by the New Testament age Christians, the song that will be sung will be a song that the angels can't sing. You notice, and if you're in the description, the angels are not singing this song. It's the 24 elders and the four beasts. They are able to sing the song. Because what does the song say? We studied this last week, but let's look at it. What does the song say? Verse, four, verse, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. A vial, most people know what a vial is, a vial full of odors. A vial is something in this in this context would be something like a bowl, a container. It's representative, okay? You don't nobody puts their prayers in a bowl. Okay, we we give our prayers to God, but it's in the, in the sense of being representative of these Christians are holding forth the prayers of other Christians, and these. Prayers are being heard. They're being given to God. These are prayers of praise. Praise to God. Praise to God the Son in particular. But notice something very carefully. Verse 9. And they sung a new song. It's a new song. It's not been sung in heaven before. It's a new song. Saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. How is he worthy? Why is he worthy? It tells us, For thou wast slain, 
They're saying, because you died, you gave your life and has redeemed us to God. Now, who can say us? Only the people included in the group. They and them, that's a different group, isn't it? That's somebody else. We and us, that's the group that we're in. That's the group I'm in. I can't say we unless I include myself in the group. Here he's saying that this group, you redeemed us, these 24 elders, you redeemed us. That means they are the born again Christians who were bought by the blood of Jesus. They're included in this group. So they're the ones singing this song. That's why the angels can't sing the song. Angels can't say they've been saved by the blood of Jesus. Right? Angels are created beings living in heaven. They've not sinned. They don't need salvation. They don't need forgiveness of their sins. But people do. And that's who these people are. The middle of verse 9. And has redeemed us to God by thy blood. And who are these people? People out of every kindred, out of every tongue, out of every language, out of every people, all the different people groups in the world, and out of every nation. Every way you can divide people in the world, all of these groups, there are people represented from that, those groups in this group. People who choose Jesus as their Savior. Verse 10, they continue their song and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, there are religions uh, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, who will teach that heaven, the place we're going to spend eternity, is actually on the earth. And that someday we will be on this earth living forever. That's not according to the Bible. That's according to doctrine and teaching that somebody else has, has um, imagined or come up with. Here, we find that he says, um, we shall reign on the earth. He didn't say we'll reign on the earth forever. He just said we shall reign. Well, we know we studied two weeks ago over in Revelation chapter 20. We studied about the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. That's what he's talking about. He says, you've made us kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. He's talking about that thousand year reign of Christ. That's what it refers to. Look at verse 11. The song has finished. The singing of the 24 elders has stopped. The Christians in heaven have stopped singing their song. And verse 11 says, And I beheld. John turns his attention to another group. And I beheld. And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. Now, Let's, let's describe the throne. The throne is described to us in chapter 4. In the center of the throne, in the midst of the throne, you have the glory of God. Represents the Father. The brightness. We never describe, they never describe God, the Father, as being an old man with white beard sitting on the throne. No. He's described as brightness and glory. That's his description. So the God the Father is in the midst at the throne. Well, we know that the Bible tells us in a symbolic way that Jesus Christ was sitting at the right hand of the Father, right? The New Testament tells us he sits at the right hand of the Father. So he's on the right hand side of the throne. Now, we also see that the Holy Spirit is there. He is represented in, in this around the throne. So we have the midst of the throne. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the midst of the throne. That's in the middle. Around the throne, 
We have the four beasts, the angelic beings that are there. Then we have the 24 elders around the throne. Then around the, th around the 24 elders, we have an innumerable amount of angels. So you have a crowd of Christians, believers, around the throne. That's the 24 elders. They represent the, 20, the, the millions and millions and millions of Christians. Then around them is an unimaginable number of angels that fills heaven. How many? I don't know. The Bible never tells us how many angels. Does it matter? No. We just know there are a lot of them. A big crowd. All right. Um, one time, Matilda, I went to, uh, well, several times, but when we lived in Poland, in Krakow, Poland, uh, Pope John Paul II would come to the city because that was his hometown, and uh, he would visit the, the city, and I would go to the, the mass, the open air mass that he would have, and I went there to take pictures and get video and things like that. As I'm not Catholic, so I wouldn't go there to worship, but I would go there to record the event. And uh, there, there was a field in the city of Krakow. It's a triangular shaped field. And um, it was used many years ago, back a thousand years ago, it was used for uh, people of the city who would have cattle, who would have cows or goats or something, and they would come in, it was an open grassy field and they would graze their animals on that field. Well, in the modern day, that's used for concerts and big events and things like that. It's just a field, nothing fancy. But they would set up a stage, and when the Pope would come, he would come there and do open-air mass. And there's a mound, a hill, that overlooks the city and, uh, called Kosciuszko Mound. And uh, Kosciuszko was a Polish war hero from years ago. Anyway, he was an American war hero, too. He fought in the Revolutionary War with George Washington against England. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this mound overlooks the city. And I would climb the mound and go up on top and, uh, and you can oversee that field and I'd get video and pictures. And the crowd was about one to two million people in that field. But you couldn't, you couldn't drive a car, all the roads were blocked and you could only walk, you'd walk for about two miles to get there. And I would ride my bicycle and I would get in real close and I would go and see that. And to see a crowd of million and a half or two million people in one place, just out in an open field, was just mind boggling. To see that many people at one time was just a fascinating thing for me. Now, I'm a hillbilly from the mountains, you know, and I've never seen that big a crowd of people at one time. And to see that, and you're looking down on that, is just fascinating to see. And I was always excited to get to see this big crowd of people. And I, the Pope would come, you can't see him. You know, he's, he's a little spot. <laughs> he's in this big, huge crowd, and you see this big entourage of people, and that's all you can see. You can't tell who's who, or, and I would have zoom lenses so I could zoom up and get close-up pictures. That was the only way I could see who anybody was, because I was so far away. But anyway, in heaven, there's gonna be such a huge crowd such a big group of people, angels, and all of this excitement going on. And the first song that gets sung is the one the Christians sing, the believers sing. And they sing it to Jesus, God the Son, and they sing it to God the Father. And they refer to the death of Jesus to pay for their sins. But then the angels say something. Verse 12, this is what the angel said, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Verse 13, we'll come back to verse 12 in just a minute. Verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, in the sea, all that are in the sea, heard I say, every soul 
every living soul, every person who has ever lived, every creature on the earth, under the earth, in the sea, all of them, all creature, all of creation, say this in unison, all at the same time. I believe in perfect harmony. They say, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto, now look who it's to, unto him that sitteth upon the throne, who's that? God the Father, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Praise from all, all creation goes out to God the Father and God the Son at that moment. Equal praise to the Father and to the Son. Jesus Christ is equal with the Father. And he's presented here in a very clear way. That the Son, God the Son, is no less God than God the Father is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three equal personalities of one God, our great God in heaven, the Trinity. Now, the praise for the one who's worthy. This is the part I want to show you because there's some particular words used here that some people have a problem with. I don't have much time because I don't want to keep you late. I've been, I've been doing better, haven't I? I've been doing better about keeping it short. Well, let's see if I can keep that going today. Brother Tom, let's see if I can do it with God's help. We'll see. But look at the words that all of creation uses and, and what is sung at this moment, okay? I'm trying to get my control here so I can see what you see. Now, verses 13 and 14, let's read them again very closely. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard, I say, John heard this with his ears, saying, notice it's everyone, all of creation, every creature, okay? And the praise was unto the one who's on the throne and unto the lamb. We've already covered that. But I want, you to, I want you to look carefully at what he says here. And I heard them saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sit upon the throne. Very similar to what we saw back in verse 11. And I want to get you to go back with me to verse 11. Will you look there with me just for a moment? Verse 11 says, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power. All right, I want you to pay attention to the words uh, let me go back here. Just give me something here just for a second. Excuse me. He said, power. Can I just, I'm going to share with you what one pastor said. This is what another pastor said, and I wrote it down because I like the simplicity of it. It's easy to understand. It's practical. What do they mean when they say he receives power? I've heard a lot of, I read a lot of different people say a lot of different things about these seven, these seven attributes, these seven things that God the Father and God the Son would receive praise for from this huge multitude of people and angels. Receive power. And we're looking at uh, verse 12. That's where we're taking all this from because it's very similar to the other verse, but just more. Receive power. And I want to explain this way. Power simply represents that there is no plan or purpose Christ can't carry out. There's nothing he can't do. That's what he means by power. Riches. I read, Brother Jerry, I read one commentator who said, riches means lots of silver and gold. 
I don't know. I don't know where he got that or how. It doesn't make any sense. Riches. He's not talking about material riches. I believe it represents this: that there is no promise. Jesus doesn't have the resources to fulfill. He has everything at his access and at his use. He can use anything to fulfill his promises. Wisdom. We know what wisdom is. Wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge in a wise way. Wisdom. There is no problem Jesus Christ can't solve because of all the wisdom he has. Also, we see the word might. Might means strength, okay? There are no powers of evil Jesus can't defeat because he has might, he has strength. Honor, there are no princes that Jesus Christ does not have rule over. He rules over all principalities and powers, over all princes, over all authority. He is authority over those. That includes Satan himself. Jesus, or God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, have authority over the devil himself. He's, he can only do what God allows him to do, no more. He's not free to do anything he wants. He is, uh, um, Brother Steve and Miss JJ, they have three dogs, four. But they have one, uh, and I'm just going to use one as an example. They have one called Diego. Diego's not a big dog, is he? No. He's not a big 100-pound dog. No. no. He's a, kind of a small dog. 45 pounds. He's dynamite in a small package. That dog is fierce. I don't know if he's afraid of anything. I mean, he'll make you think he's a lion. He's afraid of Mama. He's, he's, <laughs> he's afraid of JJ. But that dog is fierce. But you know, he can only do what Steve and JJ let him do. If they put him on a leash or something, he can only go as far as they, he, as they say he can go. He can only do what they allow him to do because they're in control. Right? He doesn't think so. He thinks he's in control, but he knows, he knows JJ's in control for sure. All right? There's always one boss in the family when it comes to the dogs, right? Always. And this, uh, where was I going with that? Satan and all of the principalities and powers of the universe are under the authority of God. Everything. There is no power. There is no authority that is not under the control of God. He controls everything. Even though those evil powers think they are in control. But God is the one who controls them. He's got them all on a leash. And he can only, they only can go as far as he lets them go. Only that far. So they, he receives honor because there are no princes that Jesus Christ does not rule over. All right? Glory. There are no principalities. Principalities are the, the uh, he's not talking about earthly principalities, but it's true too. He's talking about spiritual principalities. No demons, no, no uh, spiritual powers of this world that Jesus does not have divine rights and control over. None. And the last one is a blessing. There are no privileges that Jesus has not used in the service or cannot use in the service of others. No, he, he receives blessing because every uh, righteous, divine, wonderful thing that he accomplishes, we need to give him the blessing for it, him the praise for it. All right. Um, I won't go into great detail on the rest of the chapter. What I'm going to do is ask you to jump with me. We're going to jump over to chapter 6. Let's jump over to chapter 6. What I'd like to do is I'd like to read the first eight verses of chapter 6 just as a way of introduction to next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to start chapter 6. Now, 
chapter 4, the theme, the emphasis of chapter 4 was God the Father on the throne. The emphasis of chapter 5 is God the Son, the Lamb, in the midst of the throne. The theme of chapter 6 is the wrath of the Lamb. And it's said in this chapter, that phrase is used, the wrath of the Lamb. We're going to see that this Lamb that died to pay for our sins is also a lion. And he's going to execute his judgment on this very rebellious world during the seven years of tribulation. Starting in verse 6. In verse chapter, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6 is where we see the opening of the seals on the scroll. And that's where it starts. And the part we're going to read is about the four horsemen of Revelation. I think the world uh, calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You ever heard that phrase? Yeah. Four horsemen of the apocalypse. Folks, don't believe what Hollywood tells you about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They got it wrong. One, they don't believe the Bible. They're teaching you what somebody has imagined. Let's see what the Bible says about these four horsemen. It's very clear. Chapter 6, verse 1. And John is speaking here, and he said, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, notice the figurative language, the symbolic language used here, he says, As it were, the noise of thunder. He heard something that, to him, it sounded like very loud thunder. One of the four beasts say, come and see. Verse 2, and I saw and behold. I mean, he looked and he looked and he saw, he noticed a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. Notice he doesn't have any arrows. He just has a bow. Bow and arrow. He only has the bow. And a crown was given unto him. Unto that one who sat on the white horse, he was given a crown. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And that's it. That's all we're told. Next week we'll find out what this means. Verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal... I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And they that should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. That's it. That's all we're told about the second horse and he that sat on the horse. No name is given. Verse, the first horse and the first rider of the horse, we don't know what the name is. There's no name given. The second horse, the second rider, no name. Verse 5. Here's the third horse. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third Beast say, remember there are four beasts around the throne of God, angelic beings, they're speaking. Uh, well, there's more to it than just angelic beings, but we'll, we'll say that for now, as we talked about it later, uh, before. I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Everybody knows what? Represent that in your mind? A pair of balances. He holds a pair of balances that you weigh, you measure weight with. A pair of balances, and he holds them in his hand. Okay? And that's all we're told. That's the third horse and the third rider on the horse. Verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny 
and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Some extra information is given us about the third horse and the third rider. That somehow it's going to affect food and crops and some expenses. We'll talk about it next week. Verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And look carefully. And his name that sat on him was death. The first rider that we see a name given to. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth. To kill with sword, with hunger, and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And we're going to stop there. Next week, we'll study that. All right? Four horses of Revelation. The four horsemen of Revelation. We'll study that next Sunday. Lord willing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for your word, for your Holy Spirit. Father, I, I realize, and you know my heart, you know how much I need your help in teaching your word. And, and trying to uh, explain it and help it to be understandable. But Father, you have given us such clear teaching in the Bible. We have no excuse for not understanding it. Help us to not try to interpret it by what we already think and to not interpret it by what some a Hollywood movie uh, depicts or shows us and certainly not try to understand it by what the world tells us but to understand your word by what your Holy Spirit teaches us through your word and your word only. We thank you for your goodness to help us understand. I just pray that each of us will desire to live for God our Father and to please him. Please you, Father, with every part of our lives. Work in our hearts now to obey you. I pray that every person here, Father, will examine their hearts and make sure that they are ready to stand before you, ready to go to heaven, and to certainly not go to hell. Work in our hearts according to what we each need. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.